Praise the Lord. Well, good evening. Amen. What a beautiful day today, huh? Amen. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice. Rejoice. Amen. Hey, listen, let me apologize right off the bat. Um, this morning, um, I woke up at 4.50 and sent out the devotion. And if you tried to touch the, the little, um, uh, the thank you, sir, the link on there, it came up, log in at church track. So I want to just tell you straight out, I'm not responsible for what I do at 4.50 in the morning, okay? Yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, when we send out the devotions, we have to manually send it out every morning. And uh, so uh, I only have like a 15 minute, 30 minute, 45 minute, one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, five hour window. And it has to be on one of those. And so, uh, so then I have to wake up at different times in the morning to, to get that out. Now it's always on Facebook. All right, we set that automatically. I, I called Church Track the, the other day and said, "Hey, where is your app for me to set these up automatically?" And they said, "We don't have one." Okay, so <clears throat> I said, "Okay, they do more web dis, uh, web-based um, programs than they do app programs. Uh, Apple does more app. Um, uh, what is it? Who are the other guys? Google. Uh, yeah, do more." Uh, uh, web base uh, applications, and so there are a lot of pages to it. To make anyway, anyway, you don't want to know all that. So even I don't want to, even I don't want to know all of that. You know, I want to just be able to punch it and go. Praise God. Well, I trust you have had a good week this week. That the Lord has blessed you. Uh, we've been praying favor over you in everything that you do, every person that you meet. I believe, as the Word of God says, you're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're blessed coming in and you're blessed going out. And what did I add to that? I added something else. And you're prospering in every, se every season of your life. Amen. How many of you know there are seasons in life? Yes, amen. I can remember when our, our babies were small, you know, and I can remember when they were teenagers, you know, and, and then, thank God, I remember when they left home, you know, and, and, and so, you know, so, but there are seasons in our life, and I believe that God's blessings are not only for one season, I believe for their, all the seasons uh, in our lives. Amen. You agree with that? What does Pastor Marcia say? Do you, do you believe that? Do you receive that? <laughs> I always get her. Are you telling them, did you receive that? Amen. Well, you've got to receive it. Amen. You've got to receive it for it to actually operate in your life, don't you? That's right. Healing's there for you, but you have to receive healing. Salvation's there for you, but you have to receive salvation. Amen. Everything that God has must be received, and we receive it by faith faith. Amen. Amen. Well, stand with me, please. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We declare with our mouth that it is the day that you've made. We are glad. We're rejoicing in you. We're praising you. And we thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to come tonight to minister your word, to share a praise and adoration with, with, to, uh, for our Lord with one another corporately in this place. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are y'all ready to praise the Lord this Amen. evening? Did y'all have a day that it was just not as great as you would like it to be? But you know what? We've come tonight to just praise him, to lift up a shout of praise in the house of men. Come on. Ah, this is a kind of old song, but it's new because we haven't done it in a while. So anyway, we just want you to just rejoice with us, amen? Come on.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We know you're here. We know you're here because we brought you with us. Hallelujah. We know you're here because the word says for two or more gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Amen. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your everlasting love that never fails. We thank you for unconditional love. You don't love us because we do right. You love us because we're your children. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you tonight. Just lift your hands and say, Father God, I love you. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, um, was it that song? I, I got my, I, the words got me while I go when it says, draw me close to you. That was it. And the Lord just showed me, me putting my head on his chest. Now, men probably go, I don't know about that. But I'm telling you, remember when you were little with your dad? You'd grow up and grab him and you put your head on his chest and you could actually hear his heart beating. God's got a heartbeat for you, too. Hallelujah. We need to know that we're safe in our Father's arms. Amen? No matter what kind of a day you've had, no matter how lonely you are, no matter how much you're hurting, no matter how much you're blessed, God loves you. And he says, just put your head on my chest and feel my heartbeat for you. Hallelujah, Lord. We just worship you. That's how close he draws us in. Amen? I didn't mean that men don't know that, but, you know, you got to go, hoof, hoof, hoof. you know, I don't know how men do it. But I know this, that anytime I put my husband, and I'm not trying to be gross or romantic. I'm talking about putting my head on his chest. There's strength in that. Putting your head on the Lord's chest, the Father God's chest, and listening to his love for you. There's strength in that. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. You know, um, there was, uh, I want us to pray for a family today. Uh, it was a friend, they're friends of my sister and brother-in-law, Randy and Kathy Pigman. And uh, they, they've known them for many years. Uh, and her, the lady's name was Mary Hart. What a good name, huh? But it was M-A-R-Y-H-A-R-T. And she and her husband had been in the ministry many years. And their oldest daughter is married to Jeremy Pearson. And uh, her name's Sarah. But anyway, uh, four years ago, Mary was healed of breast cancer. And she had really been through a lot. And God healed her. And then in November, she was attacked with COVID because her immune system was probably a little low. And uh, so she's been battling this thing since November. And they said this morning she went home to be with the Lord. And they've got three grown children, but her husband is just, you know, he loved her. He's, they've been married 40 years. They're, he's just lost. You know, he's, you know, what do I have to say? Devastated. That's a good word. And so I wanted to pray for that family. And... Uh, uh, Kathy, my sister, I, I called her when I saw it on Facebook, and she said, yes, I've had a heavy heart all day, Marsha, for their family. And uh, so she was only 59, and so the Lord truly stole her from this life from us. So we want to pray for the family, though. Can you do that? Can you just pray in the Spirit as I pray for them? Father God, just pray in agreement with me, if you would. Father God, we just lift up the heart family to you. We lift up the husband and the three children to you, Lord. We lift up the ones that are missing her and the, and the love that she's put out with everyone on this earth. She's full of life in heaven now. She is full of life on earth. And we just thank you, Lord, for the comfort of the Holy Spirit that it goes to that family tonight, tonight to minister to them, to love on them, Lord. We thank you that you do draw them close to your heart and minister to them tonight. And we just give you glory and honor for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Anybody have a testimony tonight? Good, Diana. She doesn't like to use the mic, but I make her. <laughs> uh, um, I was suffering carpal tunnel, and the ladies at the group prayed for me yesterday, and I just have a tiny pain here, whereas it was all through my shoulder. It hurt bad. Okay, amen. It's gone. No, I keep praising. <laughs> Praise amen. the Lord. Hey, speak to that tingle. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, before I turn it over to the pastor, um, uh, just have a word for everybody today. Come expecting Sunday. We're going to have a supernatural Holy Ghost service Sunday. That's what the Lord told me just right there. We're going to see miracles. We're going to see healings. We're going to see salvations. But you know, he said, bring people. Bring people. Invite people. See the miraculous of the Lord, he said. We don't do miracles, the Lord says, for the believers. We do them for the unbelievers to come in to me. So be ready. You know, it's been many years back over at the other church, at the other building, God gave me a prophecy that I prophesied and I declared that people would begin pulling up in our, and that's before we had an uh, overhang, what do you call portal, what do you call them? Any driveway, anyway, whatever it is up there. <laughs> they were going to come in ambulances, and we were going to bring them in here, and God's going to heal them. It's still going to happen. There's so many hurting people out there, but he said to tell you, be prepared for a Holy Ghost service, Sunday. So that means, what does preparation mean? He says, you tell them to pray in the Spirit and get in agreement with my Spirit, for my Spirit knows who's going to be here, and my Spirit knows what's going to be ministered here. And my spirit knows how I'm going to move. So we need to get an agreement with his spirit, the Holy Spirit. Do you agree? So what are you going to do? Are you just going to say, oh, we're going to have a Holy Ghost meeting? No, he says, you get in the spirit with me. You begin praying in the spirit, believing with me. If we do that, what's going to happen? We're going to see the Holy Ghost move in this place. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Think, well, man, that's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Not on you. Not on me. <laughs> Amen? Not on me, because if a person does it, then that's not God. Amen? Amen? It's when we allow the Holy Spirit to move and minister. I, I love to tell the story when we uh, had met uh, Morris Cirillo in Dallas and got to drive him back and forth to a, a convention there we were having. I was my first church. I was a very young man at that time. And, um, and so we saw all kinds of miracles. God did all kinds of things. And uh, he told me, he said, I want you to go back. The last night he told me he was taking me back to the hotel. He said, I want you to go back and have a healing service. Now, we were Pentecostal, but had never really had a healing service in our church. Had been to healing revivals, you know, under tents and then conventions there, but not in, really in the church. And, uh, so uh, uh, I said, okay, praise God, you coming to preach? And he goes, no, you're preaching. Well, I'd preached every Sunday before that, so I didn't see anything Holy Ghost in that. And uh, so uh, he said, uh, tell the people to bring the halt, the lame, the blind, if they can get the dead up, bring them too. You know, now when you're a young preacher and you have someone like this spiritual giant. He was a spiritual giant to me stand, sitting right there beside me and telling me that. I go, yes, sir. So Sunday morning uh, in the church while I preached and I told the people, I said, we're going to have a, a service tonight. And God's going to move. Miracles are going to happen. And I said, uh, I've been told that you're to I'm to tell you this, to bring the halt, the lame, the blind. And if you get the dead up, bring them too. And, uh, you know, uh, thank God for the church because they were probably like ignorant like me, you know, and they just were obedient and they brought people that night. And we saw God do miracles uh, that night in the service. One young girl, her, her, her legs were turned out. We saw God t take them in uh, my hands and just see God bring those ankles back around, healed instantly uh, in the service. And people, um, other manifestations, 
of the Spirit of God moving. And so the pressure is not on, when we say that, the pressure is not on us. It, the, the pressure is really not even on God. He wants to do that, amen? That's his desire. He wants to manifest his spirit, his presence uh, when we are. I want to go back to something before I get into uh, the subject I'm teaching on tonight. Again, we're going back to prophets and we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about that. But I, I want to go back to what I ministered to on Sunday morning in Matthew 11. Jesus said this right here. He said, if you, if you have ears, uh, if you have ears, let them hear. And, uh, and what I was saying to you Sunday was, it's not that you don't have ears, it's that you don't have hearing ears. And in Revelation, uh, John, uh, John the Revelator said this after every, in uh, uh, chapters 2 through 3, about the seven churches. He said, him the who have, let him who hath an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord would say. Well, when we hear it, what do we do with what we're hearing? I said, what do we do with what we're hearing? We do that, right? I mean, that's what we're supposed to do. And, uh, and so anyway, I just want to encourage you. Um, if you've not been that this way this week, listen to the Spirit of God on the inside of you. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Spirit. And allow the Spirit of God to speak and minister to you. Hear, you know, when you're putting the Word of God, when you're reading the Word of God and, and you're meditating on the Word, you're getting the Word of God down on the inside of you. It's amazing to me a lot of Christians uh, can't quote Scripture, but they can tell you all the characters of certain shows that they watch all the time. Don't shout me down because I get to preaching good, okay? I always love that. Yeah. You know, it, it's because we don't spend enough time with it. And I'm not telling, saying you have to know every book, chapter, and verse, but I mean, you have to know the Word. For the Word to have impact in your life, the Word has to be down on the inside of you. And that isn't you just taking the Bible, you know, or, you know, the, remember the little uh, loaf of bread we had on the blessing loaf, we'd pull out a scripture, you know. It's not just that, it's taking that Word and meditating on it. You can read it and then walk away and forget it. But you begin to read it and meditate on it. It gets down on the inside of you, and that's what God wants to do. Too many Christians come to church, hear the Word, walk out, and never changed. Not because the Word doesn't work, because they have ears, but they don't have hearing ears. And it's very important for us to have hearing ears. All right, praise God. That's a good word. Thank you, Pastor Charles, for that good word there. Amen. Amen. Just uh, felt impressed to share that with you. We began uh, last week talking to you about prophets, and, um, and, and the reason I, I've had this in my heart, really I've had it in my heart for months to do this, is because what I began to see was some confusion because of some words that are spoken with, thus saith the Lord, and then we began to see things not, not happen exactly that way, as a matter of fact, to go opposite of that, and, uh, and then we didn't know what to trust. You know, who do we trust? Who do we listen to? What is right? What is not wrong? And so I decided that I would go and share some things with you from the Word of God about prophecy. Uh, of course, you know that I love Brother Hagin, and um, I love to sit, I sat under his ministry. I went to school at Ramah. I love Brother Hagin with all of my heart. Uh, Brother Hagin uh, gave a prophecy in 1990. I went back and looked it up. And because of what I've been teaching on, and I'd like to share that with you tonight. It's a prophecy uh, from Brother Hagen. And listen to it. It says, I, I wish I had gotten the audio so I could play it because it would be better in his voice than mine. But, uh, but listen to this if you would. As a matter of fact, just close your eyes. Don't go to sleep on me, but just close your eyes for just a moment. I want you to listen with your heart, not your head. All right? I want you to listen with your heart. So close your eyes and I want you to, every spirit that's God, that's of God, will walk in line, talk in line, walk in line, and act in line with the written word. For the word has been given by the spirit, and that which contradicts the word is not of the spirit. So one is at a disadvantage if they do not know the word or if the word has not been taught or preached unto them, so truly they are spiritual children and at a disadvantage. 
Be no longer spiritual babies or children who are carried about with every wind of doctrine whereby they lie in cunning craftiness to deceive. Stand firm upon the word. Follow those of sound character. Follow those who have proven themselves over the years as steadfast and true. Follow those who are not filled with frivolity or foolishness. Follow those who are true. For I say unto you that there are many false prophets and uh, prophets loose in the land today. Those who go about calling themselves apostles are not apostles. Do not honor them as apostles. For those who have a true bona fide ministry in that area will be recognized by the body of Christ and the body will be the one who recognizes them and honors them. And those who call themselves apostles and say, I am apostle so-and-so, or I am prophet so-and-so, don't you accept it for a moment, for they are false prophets or false apostles. Those who are truly called of me, saith the Lord of hosts, will humble themselves before me and minister in the power of the Spirit. And they will have a recognized ministry without putting any name tag on it, and the church will be blessed. But those who come along and say, I'm a prophet, and you must listen to me, you must do what I tell you to do and follow me, no, they're not following the Lord, so don't follow them. You follow the Lord, and you will be blessed, and your children, your home, your household shall be blessed, and you will be a blessing to many. But follow, that which is, but follow that which is false and confusion will set in and the enemy will gain control over you and over your children and over your household and great shall be the fall thereof. But walking in the light will dispel all darkness and fear will depart. And the goodness of the Lord shall be thine and thou shalt enjoy the blessings of your heavenly Father and you'll have much cause for rejoicing, thus saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. It is a good word. It is a good word uh, for us today because there are many people who call themselves apostles or, or call themselves prophets uh, who are doing so not because the Lord has signified them through the body, but because they have uh, taken on that title. And uh, I want to make a statement to you just at the very beginning. I am not a sensationist, cessationist. It's uh, C-E-S-S-A-N-I-S-T. I am not a cessationist. And that means, what that means is that you do not believe in prophets or apostles today. I do believe in them because I believe the Word of God. And so tonight, I want you to know that right off, that I believe that there are apostles today. I believe they have a word for the church and for our nation. And I believe the church should listen and then look at what is happening and seeing if those are things are coming to pass. I want to give you two scriptures tonight. I'm going to give you several, but start with two if we could. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, And I made this statement to you last week that I wanted to go back to the Old Testament to find out about the prophets. Now, when we get to the New Testament, let me just jump here real quick. When you get to the New Testament, really the book of Acts is the birthing of the church. We see the church being birthed. There there really is not yet the five-fold ministry filled out until you get to Paul's teaching uh, either in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 12 or 14, or in Ephesians chapter 4. And so, uh, so you do have those who are called apostles. And if you look at the New Testament, uh, it will define apostles as those according to the Word of God. Now, not according to me, but according to the Word of God. You were an apostle if you had been, had seen Jesus Christ uh, uh, 
visibly with your eye. They were called the apostles. The 12 were there. And uh, again, um, uh, Paul calls himself, he's, because he gives, the, the, um, he gives the, the proof of that, is that on the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to me and, and spoke to me. Uh, and so he gave proof of his ministry. But that ministry had to be confirmed by everyone else. Paul didn't just choose that title. That title was conferred upon him by those uh, leaders, those church leaders, and the prophets and church leaders at that time, and the apostles. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, and let's read about, uh, about prophets, because prophets really did not change very much from Old Testament to New Testament, all right? So, here's what God says about prophets. In verse 15, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not bear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. The, the children of Israel, when Moses came down from the, from the uh, Mount, the first town, Mount Sinai, uh, when he first came down, the glory of God, he had been in the presence of God, and the glory of God was physically upon him so that when he walked into the presence of the, the children of Israel, this great group, literally the people fell back because of the presence of God. And then they, then they make this statement to Moses, we don't, we don't want you to come down and do that anymore. We, because Moses said, come on, I want you to come up to the mountain and I want you to see the glory of God. No, 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 we don't want to. You go, t you go up there and you tell us. And so that's what they're talking about, the prophet. The prophet here is Moses, all right? And he says, they see, uh, that, that uh, he says uh, uh, in the middle of that verse 16, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord thy, my God, neither let me see this great fire anymore that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. For I will raise up a prophet from amongst the brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command thee. Now, God is giving to them exactly what a prophet will do in the Old Testament, all right? And he says, I will raise them up, a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Do you know what that means? If God said it and you heard it, you're now responsible for the word that was shared. Think about that. When we come to church and the Word of God is opened and the Word of God is, because this is the Word of God, when the Word of God is shared, we then become responsible for the Word that we have heard. That's why that message last week, having ears to hear, you hear not, Jesus said. You're not taking that Word and doing that Word. But this is the, this is the role of the prophet in the Old Testament. And it shall come to pass, in verse 19, that whosoever will not hearken unto my voice, which I speak of my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak in my name, which I have not commanded to him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou shalt say in thine heart, now here's the question. How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? In other words, how do we know if it's a true word or not? You know, wouldn't you like to know that? That's a good question. And uh, he says this, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. That's how we'd say that, thus saith the Lord. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not or nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. 
but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. I want to tell you something. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, and especially the beginning of the church, that the, uh, the prophets, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 11 and chapter 13 in just a moment, but the prophets in the Old Testament spoke much the same as the prophets in the New Testament. And they spoke the word of God, thus saith the Lord. And uh, they spoke to really two things. They spoke uh, uh, the blessings and the judgment of God on the nation of Israel. If you read, um, if we get past the historical books like Joshua and Judges and some of the historical books, and we get into the, the, the books of the prophet, both major and minor, what we find is those prophets were raised up by God to speak words unto them. Now, were there false prophets during those times? Absolutely, there were. Absolutely, there were false prophets. How did they judge whether a man was a true prophet or not? Whether what he spoke, whether he, that which he spoke, thus saith the Lord, whether it came to pass or not. And the Word of God says that the people were to judge whether it was a true prophet or not by what they spoke. Are you with me? So, so that's how they were to judge them. And so, uh, he says here, he says that um, the, uh, they were to, if they spoke presumptuously and it did not come to pass, it was not God speaking to him. Now, I know someone would say, well, Pastor Charles, in uh, the Old Testament, when you have prophets like Daniel or Ezekiel, uh, and they prophesied, many of those prophecies were not just what we call foretelling, but they were foretelling. They were telling about a future events. Here's what we find in the Old Testament, that many of the prophecies had dual purposes with them. Their prophecies were to come to pass then, and they would come to pass in the future as well. All right? And so, uh, so we began to look at that. But the prophecy had to come to pass. When, uh, when Jeremiah would preach uh, that uh, you were to uh, give up your, your, your worship of Baal and other gods or uh, um, um, Elijah uh, to, to uh, come against the prophets of Baal, uh, not only were, was uh, what he said true, uh, but it came to pass. He came to Ahab and said, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to rain for seven years. It did not rain for seven years. And so, it's important that we understand the judging of prophecy in the Old Testament really is not very much different in the New Testament. And especially, uh, see, um, we have to understand is that, that the church is forming, the church is, is growing, it's, uh, it is in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in an embryonic state when we see in the book of Acts, all right? And so, really, there are very few churches that have been established. So, if you don't have the churches established, you don't have the full five-fold ministry of, that's available to the church. Now, churches began like the church in Antioch, and Barnabas was there in Antioch, and Barnabas went and got Paul, brought Paul, Saul at that time, Saul there, and told him, well, I want you to come and teach. And Saul, Saul taught for a year those new believers there in uh, Antioch, where they were first called Christians. You know why they were called Christians? Because Christians are supposed to be, if you translate that, it means Christ-like. In other words, they should reflect Christ. All right. So, when they are mentioned um, uh, in, uh, the book in, in the book of Acts, prophets are mentioned some 30 times. 25 of those are mentioned of Old Testament prophets. And as I said before, again, the structure of the church had not taken place. Just jot these scriptures down, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 through 12, which gives to us gives to the church the five-fold ministry. First, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers, all right? So, there are, five, there are five offices there that are given. How many offices were there in the Old Testament? I gave that to you last week. There are three offices in the Old Testament, king, priest, 
and prophets, okay? And the Holy Spirit did not reside in any of those. He would come upon them. Many times you see under David's ministry, the Holy Spirit coming upon him, and you hear the voice of the Lord coming. To, that's the reason we have Psalms. That's the reason we have the Word that we, we go back and we study. Why? Because these are the words of God, and they've written those down. They've given those words uh, to us. And so we have there in that, we have uh, this... Uh, the, these uh, prophecies that are given here. So uh, the structure, as the structure is being developed, then you begin to see uh, the prophets, and we'll talk about Agabus and uh, the other prophets that are there in the New Testament. But when they're mentioned in the New Testament, when they are mentioned in the New Testament, they are mentioned not just by the prophet themselves, but they are mentioned with the church leaders. All right? Those that were apostles or those like Barnabas, who was a leader who had helped to start the church at Antioch. And, uh, and so, so it wasn't just a freestanding ministry out here by itself. It's interesting to me that when God gave the offices of ministry in, in, uh, in uh, Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 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 12, when he gave those, he gave it for the body of Christ. Right? It's just like God. Now, so, so that fivefold ministry is for who? For who? The body of Christ. So, who was the Old Testament prophets or priests or king? Who were, who were they for? The children of Israel. Almost every prophecy, the word there tells us that everything is directed toward one nation, isn't it? It was the nation of God. It was the nation that God had created. He called and made this nation specially for him. He says, these are my people. And so then God raises up a king, he, and then he raises up an order of priests who are to minister the sacrificial offerings, and then he raises up uh, the prophets who are the mouthpiece of God. So they ministered to this nation called Israel. Did they speak about other nations? Sure they did. They prophesied about others. So over here we come to the New Testament and we see in the New Testament, now there is a little different order. There are now apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Were there apostles in the New Te Old Testament? Nope. You know, the, the prophets actually really took on the role of teaching the people the words that God was speaking. And so, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, we see a little bit different role because now we have prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. And I don't have time to go into fivefold ministry, the whole uh, amount of the, the fivefold ministry, but I do want to go, if I could, I do want to go over to uh, Acts chapter 11 first. So if you would turn there, Acts 11, and we're going to look at verse 27, 28. When in the New Testament the prophets are mentioned with other church leaders, the other church leaders, if a prophet prophesied something, there was then a bearing of witness. All right? These men, uh, and we'll get to in a moment, I'll just show you what happens when, when uh, they get together. When they got together, they did something. They prayed in the Holy Ghost. Amen. You know, I'll tell you, you get people praying in the Holy Ghost, God's going God's to speak. That, that's why it's so important in our church. That's why it's so important in our church. That, and, and we are a spirit-filled church. We believe in lifting our hands and praying in the Holy Ghost. Because when we begin to do that, the Spirit of God begins to have an unction in this place. That's why there are tongues in interpretation. And, and many times if we had somebody in our church that stood in the office of a prophet, many times they would begin to prophesy. That's, that's that office that we have there in the New Testament. I believe every, every uh, position in the, or every office should be respected. Okay? I, I made a statement to you last week, uh, do you believe that there are false prophets? And I gave to you a list of men who had said things about the election that did not come to pass. And did I, then I ask you this question, do you believe there are false prophets? And I said to you, no, I do not. 
I believe many of them got caught up in the moment, began caught up in their flesh and the things that were going on, and this seemed almost like a tidal wave in, in, the, in Christianity or especially in evangelical movements. It began this tidal wave, and many of them, I believe, were swept up into that. Even some of those that prophesied that and said, I agree with that, and have come back and told in their own heart, I did not really feel that at that time. So in Acts chapter 11, go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. I, I hope you're following with me tonight. Acts chapter 11. And um, let's see, let's start with verse 27. Verse 27. Man, there's just so many, so many good things here. Well, let's start with verse 27. We'll read verse 27 and 28. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate, that he should be slain. Well, the prophets that they're talking about there, I'm sorry, my, I'm, in, uh, I'm in the wrong one, aren't I? I'm in the, I am. But that's still about the prophets there, isn't it? Remember when they read the prophets, who were the prophets they were reading about? Isaiah, Isaiah 53, and still yet. Uh, even though th this is what's confusing sometimes when, uh, when we look at the Jewish nation is that they had men who were teaching in the synagogues, rabbis who were teaching or prophets who, the prophets they were talking about are the, the prophets that had spoken, all right? They had them on the scrolls and they read this and even though they had it in front of them, they still ignored it or denied it. I don't know any people that do that, that have God's word in front of them and then don't abide by that. I just, I'm, I'm still looking to see if I can find anybody like that. All right, let's go back to 11, verse 27. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one by the name of Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all of the world. So here is a man who stands up and he prophesies not only in Jerusalem, not only in Galatia where Antioch is, but in all the world there will be a great famine, all right? Now, he didn't just, he didn't prophesy that to the church. Now, listen to me. He didn't prophesy that to the church. He prophesied that in the spirit with the church leaders. See, too many times people want to take the platform they have, quote unquote, get a word from God and step on that platform and blast it all over Christianity. And then it not come to pass. And then what happens to Christianity? Gets a black eye. Now notice the end of that verse. Notice the end of the verse. This reason I gave you this verse. Notice the end of it. It says this right here. Um, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Did it happen? See, that's the reason he gave us that. So that we would know that uh, when they spoke those words, that those words would come to pass. Go over to chapter 13. In verse uh, 1, and now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Now we've got prophets and teachers. All right, prophets and teachers. As Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, uh, Simeon from Niger was actually from, he was Nigerian, all right, from uh, Africa. And Lucius of Cyrenium and Manian which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered, now notice this, and as they ministered to the Lord, as they ministered to the Lord, who did they minister to? To the Lord. In other words, really what happened, we could say it like this, they had a prayer meeting. They had a prayer meeting. It says they ministered to the Lord and fasted 
and the Holy Ghost spoke. Oh, my. You want to you, do you want to know the the I hate to say it this way the formula for getting God to move they prayed and fasted before God and when that in that it's almost like the upper room when they got together and began to pray together in unity they were praying in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit began to speak he said the Holy Ghost spoke now it says this right here he said, uh, as they missed the Holy Ghost spoke, said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereof I have called them. So part of, the, part of that was uh, the calling and the separation of those in the ministry. But again, they didn't just stand up and say, well, I believe God's called you to do this, or I believe God's called you to do that. I've seen too many people, and I shared with you last week, where I, we had someone come to our church, and he wanted to prophesy over everybody. He said, I got a word for everybody. That's not how the Holy Ghost works. I said, that's not how the Holy Ghost works. And it's important for us to understand, wouldn't it be great? So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to line you up, and God has a word, you know, and every time you come, there's going to be a word for you. Well, to me, what you become dependent upon then is somebody else hearing from God and telling you what God's saying. Now, I don't know about you, and, and, and I understand the role of a prophet, but let me tell you something. The role of the prophet does not uh, um, usurp the role of you hearing the Spirit of God for yourself. I heard... Uh, I heard um, um, I heard this minister <laughs> say, I've had a lot of people prophesy to me. He said, and when they prophesied to me, if I didn't get a witness in my spirit, I didn't dismiss it because maybe I, I'm not right where I should be for that to, to really bear witness. He said, but what I do is I would set it aside. I have in my office, I, I pull them out every once in a while, uh, 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 people have given me prophecies concerning the ministry that God was going to use us in. And I have, I pull them out and I read them sometime because I want to see, Lord, are we, are we on track? Is this on track or what, you know? And, uh, and it's interesting to look at that. But Fred Price would say this right here, he'd say, don't just take every word every person gives to you. And I, I'm, I'm just going to be frank with you, and, and some people are not going to like it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I believe that a lot of Christians are gullible. They don't want to do the hard work of getting in the realm of the Spirit and hearing the Spirit of God for themselves. And isn't it much easier for, say, Miss Anita, you prophesy, come prophesy to me and tell me what God wants me to do. Hello? Hello? So, so we need, because we, see, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come upon those three, right? But who does the Spirit of God come upon in the New Testament? Every believer. Every believer. He lives in us, amen? He would, in the Old Testament, he would come down upon them, upon them, the Holy Spirit would be upon them. But in the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit. Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit lives in you. In John 16 and 17, read that sometime because he tells you the ministry of the Holy Spirit for every believer, not just for the five-fold ministry uh, of that. Amen. Well, um, in Acts chapter 11, verse 27, did we, we read that, yeah. Here's what I believe the office of a prophet is today. I believe the office of a prophet today is to warn us of the attacks of Satan and then to, for prophets to judge other prophets' words. Hello? In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, just jot it down, verse 9, and then in verse 29 through 31, it talks about, it talks about not all are prophets, not all are apostles. Not all are, are workers of miracles. 
There are offices that God uses, and thank God for prophets, but prophecy, even in the Old Testament, is more foretelling than it is foretelling. In the New Testament, what book do we have that really is primarily foretelling? Last book in the Bible, Revelation. And I don't remember John ever going around saying, I'm a prophet. He's an apostle, and God used him in the office of a prophet to declare the end times. Hello? So it's important that we understand that, that in the, the word of prophecy, if you go back again, if you go back into the Old Testament and see the ministry of the prophet in the Old Testament was, was correction. I believe the church is in need of correction today. Hello? I believe we need some prophets standing up and saying, listen, grace is great, but we've taken grace. The church has taken grace all the way over here in a ditch, and it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what you do. I mean, grace is going to cover you. But see, that's not the whole truth. That's not the whole truth. We love grace. How many of you love grace? I love grace. Amen. But there's a responsibility that we have in our own life. And, and, and men of God who stand in those office, and I've told you, I'm not one of them. I'm, 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 a, I'm a pastor. That I, love, I love that title, pastor. That's what I are. That's what I've always been. I love that. That's, I'm, a, I'm a one who it grows and develops and nurtures the body of Christ. I take converts and make them disciples. Because people that get born again aren't disciples yet, they're still converts. Disciples are ones who learn the Word and begin to do the Word, and the Word impacts their life. Yes. And Jesus taught us that we're to go forth and make disciples, not converts. And in the age of the church today, we have a lot of people who I believe are converts, but who are not disciples of Jesus Christ. And therefore, many of them are like the Corinthian church. You see works of the flesh involved in, the, in their lives because they've not been dis, uh, discipled and to take the truth of God's Word, every part of God's Word, and apply it to their lives. It's important for us, it's important for us to, uh, to do that. And so, um, so anyway, I wanted to share with you, and I'll close here, it's 8 o'clock, I'll, I'll close with you, but I, I want you to understand, um, we, we, we love the fivefold ministry. I know men of God who are apostles. I do. I know men who are, who are what I call the generals. They've led the way. They've been out there when nobody else wanted to do it, and they've led the way for the church. They, they in their teachings, and we, we saw that in the 70s, some of the, the teaching for the first time ever, not ever, but for the first time in the late 60s and 70s, we saw people actually bringing their Bibles and their notebooks to church and, and opening up their Bibles, and, and teachers would begin to teach the Word of God, and we saw people begin to grow. Anybody ever go to a Bill Gaither seminar? Isn't it Bill Gaither? Yeah. Gother, Bill Gother, Bill Gother, yeah. Yeah, I, I've had, I've had uh, Bill Gaither's a singer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll get it here in a minute. I mean, um, and, and, I mean we've, got the, we've got the books to prove we went. We spent the whole uh, weekend, I mean, multiple hours, you know, sitting and being taught and trained in the Word of God. Uh, there was one that we would see a guy's name, Winky Prattney. Winky Prattney taught youth and, and was teaching on, on how to re minister to youth. And uh, uh, Josh McDowell, who uh, w was teaching on, we'd go to see, hear him, he would teach on how to approach college students and, and minister the Word of God on campuses, and they, they were literally discipling us to understand what to do in the church. And we began to see that. In the 80s, we began to see a movement of the Spirit of God. You know, Brother Hagin, I remember at Rhema, do you guys remember at Rhema? And uh, there would be a move of the Spirit of God. Brother Hagin, get up and teach. I'll tell you, be a, I, I'm, I'm going to go to over just a minute, okay? But I, I'd hear Brother Hagin, and he'd teach you the, the simplest message in the world. And then the Spirit of God would begin to move. 
And I'm telling you, it was like a wave that just flew, went right over that. We saw it at Christ for the Nations. Uh, when we would go up there, we'd see people begin to worship and praise God. And just a wave of the Spirit of God would, would move. People would be slain in the, in, back into their chairs or on the floor. I mean, and nobody's in near them. Nobody's around. That's the wave of the Spirit of God. And today, we want to get you in and out as fast as we can, you know, because we know you got plans, other more important things to do than church. <laughs> Hello? So, you know, so we're going we're gonna to design our services to be uh, 45 minutes, and uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes of that's going to be singing, 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 uh, singing, worship. And, uh, and then I'm going to give a, a 15, uh, maybe 20 minute, if I get long winded devotional, you know, and, uh, and, and then we're, we're going to, uh, you know, break up from there. See, where's the move of God? See, where's the move of God? When we say we, we had, we had to narrow and, and I know no pastors that do multiple services. And one of the things that they hate about it is that how do we let the spirit of God move in those services? Can't. I don't know. Mm. Well, okay. I don't know if you got anything out of that or not, but I hope you did. I hope you did. I hope there's some things that you, you've learned tonight. And, you know, again, I don't want you going out of here saying that Pastor Charles is against all prophets. I'm not. I'm not. I'm for prophets. That's an office that God has created, and we should never speak against that. But I do believe that we have the right to judge prophecy, whether prophecy is God or not. All right. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. It's quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts away on one edge and brings healing on the other. I thank you, Father God, that you give us insight into your word, knowledge and understanding, Father God, about how these offices operate. That's okay for us to learn those, to know this, important for us to do that, so that we'll not be easily beguiled or deceived, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for uh, you giving us understanding tonight. You've said, seek understanding knowledge and understanding, and you will give it liberally to us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. We love you. Have a blessed week. See you Sunday morning. Woo!